Once upon a time, there were two friends. They were both very different in a lot of ways, but one thing they had in common was a love for fighting games. For years, they had competed in all sorts of them, both regionally and internationally. Tekken, Street Fighter, Soul Calibur, Guilty Gear, you name it. At the point we catch up with them, they had just been introduced to Super Smash Bros. Melee. And while they were both smitten with the game, they just couldn't grasp the people who played it. They all had such weird opinions. So many things were banned, so many characters frowned upon, and even whole games completely disregarded. Having played in a number of tournaments and watched a fair number more, the friends started to notice Melee's much uglier sister, Brawl. At first, only really because it so often happened to be on before the main event, Melee. But after a while, a true fascination cropped up. The two friends asked their new Melee playing acquaintances about Brawl and were met by nothing but rude dismissal. They ought to stay away from that game. It would do them no good. One evening, the friends, already culturally removed from their melee playing acquaintances, decided that they had had enough of these vague warnings and that they were tired of being shut down. They figured the melee players were already complaining about so many odd things in their game, they probably just found Brawl bad for some arbitrary reason. And so they both decided to get a copy of the game and make up their own minds. After booting up the game and playing around with it, the friends almost instantly reached out over the internet to each other. What the hell had the melee players really been on about? Sure, Brawl did lack some of the cool mechanics of melee, but all in all, it was a pretty similar game, no? You could still dash dance as Marth and hit a forward tilt to forward air with Sheik. What was the big fuzz about? The friends scheduled a session for the very next day, eager to explore a brand new world. And this is the part where I tell you that me and my friend tried Brawl and it was nothing at all like Melee. And in fact, not a very good game. At least not if you want something that is remotely like Melee at all. If you play the game by yourself, you can very easily get tricked into thinking it is a mechanically multifaceted system. But the problem is that Nintendo axed one pretty key ingredient to any fighting game. Brawl doesn't have hit stun, basically. Like, there are no combos. You can't actually do forward tilt to forward air with Sheik. That no longer exists. It's just a bunch of waiting around, and it's mostly really fucking boring. As dull as Brawl was, and is, there still was that one shining moment where it felt like it held such promise. It was a fleeting moment, sure, one that was dispelled pretty much the instant we actually started playing a match, but that moment still happened. Something about Brawl tricked us into believing that the game was something it absolutely was not. So that, even from our very competitively minded perspective, we thought there was something there for us. As much as I could sit here and wax poetically about the shortcomings of Brawl, there are other people who are way more suited to such endeavors. No, I'm here to talk to you about the implied promise of another title. One featuring iron fists, questionable hairdos, and a hefty dose of daddy issues. We're abandoning the realm of 2D fighters for some more dimensionally sound pastures. Since the mission statement here relies on promises unfulfilled, you probably think we're going to take a look at this Tekken. Uh, or maybe even this one. But, alas, neither of those titles are what interests me today. We're here to chat about the last truly iterative and formulaic game of the series, Tekken Tag Tournament 2. 
I've noticed that Tekken Tag 2 has of late almost reached a mythical status within the Tekken community. A sentiment often repeated by people who began playing the series with Tekken 7 and was not around for Tekken Tag 2's lifespan. This is pretty understandable, I think. Not only do older titles tend to have their reputation balloon a bit as the current one is entering the later stages of its lifespan, but Tekken Tag 2 holds a lot of immediate visible allure to someone who finds issues with Tekken 7's more zany additions. There are no guest characters from other series ruining the purity of your Tekken gameplay. It has a massively more creative combo system, and the giant roster allows crazy levels of exploration with tag combinations. And lastly, but possibly most enticing, is Tag 2's fabled emphasis on movement. I can hear the Tekken people salivating all the way from here. So what's the big idea? Of course, if you're a player who started with 7, fed up with the idiosyncrasies of that game systems and roster, you'd be attracted to the idea of playing a game like Tag 2 that would let you circumvent all those things you take issue with. But I'm here to say that you think you do, but you don't. Now at first glance, it might seem pretty unfair to decide what other people want and not. But firstly, I'd like to state that something being unfair has never stopped me in the past. And secondly, the portrayal of Tekken Tag 2 by people who have not experienced the system leads me to believe most players have no idea what the impact of those systems truly entails. To begin with, let's return to that aforementioned list of enticing qualities that the Tekken 7 player sees in Tag 2. A massive roster of iconic Tekken characters, an amazingly deep combo system, a slower game pace, and of course, a much heavier focus on movement. All things that hopefully lead to the individual having an experience with much grander possibilities of player expression and a more varied metagame, both in terms of community-wide character selection and mid-match strategic options. But I'm here to tell you that the reverse is true. You aren't living in a reality in which Tekken 7 is hemming you in and a switch to Tag 2 would set you free but the exact opposite. It is, however, pretty easy to understand why one would have that thought, though. Tekken, being an extremely iterative series with relatively small adjustments compared to its contemporaries, leads players to easily project what they know onto an earlier or later game system. Sometimes they are correct, lots of times they aren't. And Tag 2 looks and feels a hell of a lot like Tekken 7 in all the important ways, so booting it up and messing around a bit with all the immediately cool systems could, and probably has, led to a lot of players seeing the light, so to speak. To make it easier to understand just what the hell I mean when I say you think you want to play Tag 2 but you really don't, 
We have to break apart and look at all these qualities individually to see what exact impact they have on the game system. And what better place to start than the biggest immediate selling point of Tekken Tag 2, the tag and combo systems. Trying to paint the combo system of Tag 2 in a bad light might seem like an exercise in futility. But trust me, I am going somewhere with this. To begin with, perhaps a quick reminder of what exactly differs between Tekken 7 and Tag 2 in terms of their combo systems. Perhaps the most notable difference in their basic systems lies in the differing combo extensions available in both games. Tekken Tag 2 and Tekken 6 before it utilize a system called Bound a once-per-combo hit state that left the opponent's character in an off-the-ground state after certain attacks, allowing the character doing the hurting to pick their adversary up from the ground to continue the combo. This might sound exceedingly familiar if you played a bunch of Tekken 7, seeing as that game has a combo extender you could almost word-for-word word describe in the same way. The key distinction between Bound and Tailspin Tekken 7 system lies in two noteworthy differences. For one, Tailspin launches the adversary away from you at a high angle, while Bound slams them into the ground, making Tailspin a way more effective tool at carrying the opponent large distances throughout the air. And secondly, Bound as a combo extender could be utilized at the wall to further increase the amount of hits possible in any given wall combo, something that is not true for Tekken 7's Tailspin. Now, on paper, Bound makes for a more interesting and dynamic combo extender than Tailspin. For one, it gives the person performing the combo certain choices to consider. Is it stronger to save Bound until you hit the wall for a perhaps larger damage payout? And if you mismanage this mental equation, you might end up losing out. It also adds a further contrast to certain launchers, where a faster combo starter might immediately bound your opponent, leading to a weaker combo with worse wall carry potential, over, say, a slower or more risky launcher. The same dichotomy technically exists within Tekken 7, but instantly tail spinning launchers are in practice way closer to their less diminished version than an instant bound one in Tag 2. So far, so good, right? The problems start cropping up when we add on Tekken Tag 2's bespoke combo mechanic, Tag Assault. Pressing the tag button when your point character hits the opponent mid-air with a bound move will trigger a tag assault, in which you will briefly be given control of your anchor character and the opponent will be bounced way up in the air instead of slammed down to the ground. I say briefly, but maybe it's fair to say that this definition is somewhat fluid. What immediately comes to mind when you lay your eyes upon tag assault for the first time tends to fall somewhere between wow think of all the possibilities and this unlocks endless creativity which is why you might be taken aback when i say tag assault is a net negative on the game's overall diversity and makes tag 2 a lot more homogenous than other titles to begin with there are the instantly noticeable drawbacks of a partner combo system Tag Assault tends to squash the gap when it comes to particular character strengths vis-a-vis -vis combos. To put it in plain speak, characters who are designed with particular strengths or weaknesses tend to have those pushed aside to all more or less join the pack in the middle. There are very few team combinations in Tag 2 that could be described as having particularly high or low damage, with a few exceptions. And the same thing tends to be applicable to carry distance as well. In short, it sort of makes everyone the same. But wait, there's more. Not only does Tag Assault practically homogenize these character traits in the game's roster, it also impacts the value of specific launchers. The earlier described unique aspect that Bound has over Tailspin, 
i.e. instant bound launchers almost always being way worse than their normal launching counterparts, is largely nullified by the consistency boost in both damage and carry that Tag Assault gives them. The same critique can be levied towards specific types of launcher states that flip the opponent over and give way weaker combo routes. Tag Assault essentially nullifies this launcher variety by either easily allowing the opponent to be flipped back mid-air onto an easier comboable axis, or allowing such a strong combo that it practically makes no difference. A perhaps less directly damnable consequence of Tag Assault is that combo damage is insanely high in Tekken Tag 2 making the game easily snag the top spot in most reward per launcher in any modern Tekken iteration. It is at this point I gently remind you, the viewer, that you only need to KO one of your opponent's characters to win a round in Tekken Tag. Smiley. In an effort to combat the pretty insane strength of Tag Assault, the Tekken team implemented a number of drawbacks to its usage. For one, Tag Assault leaves a large portion of the depleted health as recoverable red life if the opponent's point character gets a chance to tag out. It also immediately puts the opposing player's anchor character in rage, increasing their damage potential dramatically if they can successfully switch in. Said rage state can also be spent to execute an invincible safe on block tag out from the grounded state called Tag Crash an immensely strong getup option that allows a player to more or less skip the entirety of Tekken's 500 IQ Oki semi-play. And mind you, this isn't Tekken 7's limp-wristed excuse for scary ground game you're skipping. It's floatable backroll ground-hitting relaunching tech-catching unblockable big dick Tekken Oki. As if these drawbacks weren't enough, Pressing tag as you are hitting your opponent with certain launchers allows you to instantly tag your point character out and the following combo will actually delete recoverable life entirely, giving tag 2, at least on paper, the sort of game and mechanical dichotomy that mother-in-laws dream of. With all of these drawbacks in mind, it might come as a bit of a shock when I tell you that the strongest way to play Tag 2 is to basically always opt for Tag Assault. The benefit of fuck huge damage and great carry pretty much always outweigh the negatives. Even in situations where your characters can easily switch out mid combo, like only practice Tag 2 team of Leo Lars, you still saw the vast majority of players autopilot into Tag Assault pretty much every single time. Consequently, the post-combo Okizeme game of Tag 2 is, for pretty much all teams and interactions, based entirely on the cat and mouse game of baiting Tag Crash. If you can catch your opponent trying to take the greedy way out for a regular tag, you will, in a lot of instances, have won the round and if you inversely manage to correctly bait a tag crash with a sidewalk, backdash or parry, you almost always put yourself at a massive life advantage and the opponent is back in the same mind game. The prevalence of tag assault and the following tag crash Ogizeme mind game means that taking the opponent to the wall often has a less discernible effect on the match. Sure, a wall combo will still do more damage than one without, but damage is already really high and the following Oki Zemi play will pretty much play out in an almost identical fashion. To tag crash or not to tag crash? That is the question. Thus, Tag Assault homogenizes the cast not only in terms of damage, carry length and launcher strength, but also ends up making the roster more samey in homogenizing post-combo Oki into one recurring situation. All of this might have been debatably worth it in the end if the combo system ended up being deep and cool enough to warrant constant exploration and retooling. Tag Assault is, in theory, a system almost without limits, but practically, just like with the vast majority of combo systems, you end up doing the same one or two combos. 
just like in any other Tekken game. Perhaps you could argue that the exploration period of Tag 2 was more interesting and exciting than other titles, but that period is long gone, and most stable optimal routes are already calcified and readily available online. But enough yapping about how those specific Tag 2 mechanics mash all the characters into the same mold combo-wise. There's more going on in the game, right? Tekken, after all, has a rich history of strong keep-out characters and annoying close-range pokers, shipping away at the opponent's health. So just because combos and Oki are largely homogenized, that doesn't mean poking characters can't be just as prevalent as always. Well, about that. The Tekken team over at Bamco did in fact take precautionary steps to increase the value of poking in a game system that was, well, perhaps best described as potentially volatile. While the health value of any given character in Tag 2 stayed at 180 points, just like in Tag 2's predecessor Tekken 6, the calculation for damage scaling on grounded hits was made stronger, going from 120 to 135%, meaning pokes, when rounded off, ended up doing around 13 to 15% more damage on average. Something that sounds pretty great, until you realize that combo damage skyrocketed. While it is hard to say what the average combo damage of every team ends up being in Tag 2, characters in general saw an at least 30% increase in combo damage when compared to their earlier iteration. So not only are combos strong in the sense they always are, you know, doing fatty damage in one big chunk and all that, they also tend to immediately put pressure upon the opponent to tag or die, and they do this in a very constricting, recurring situation that is very easy to practice. Which means poking as a means to actually win rounds and not solely as a means to set up launch combos is quite massively impacted as compared to earlier Tekken titles. In Tag 2, the pendulum has swung quite heavily risk-reward-wise into the corner of combos over poking. Now, you would think that this dichotomy would represent the biggest blow to poking that Tag 2 had to offer, but you forget yourself. We haven't talked about movement yet. Good movement makes for good games, right? It's hard for me to think of a more universally accepted viewpoint within the community. We love that shit. Seeing people style on others by dodging and weaving, or someone making an insane comeback through the clever application of being a slippery little git. A theory that is lent further credence if you consider what happens to games where movement gets dumpstered. Consider, for example, Tekken 4, a game more or less completely shunned by history, largely because it made drastic cuts to the efficiency of Backdash as a neutral spacing tool. Or later iterations of Soul Calibur, where glitches like step guarding were deleted and counter hitting states were applied, tarnishing the series' legacy of being THE movement fighter. But I happen to think that this theory isn't necessarily true, or should at least probably be rewarded a bit. Tekken Tag Tournament 2 has, at first glance, a movement system that doesn't seem very far removed from the one you will be familiar with in Tekken 7. There's backdash, sidestep, and sidewalk, all cancelable into stuff just like in Tekken 7. However, unlike in 7, because of buffs to distances gained, time window to guard again, and smaller hitboxes on attacks, 
Tag 2 has quite a lot stronger sideways movement, something that might come across as a godsend if you're a Tekken 7 player. After all, being able to step more things is an oft-recurring request and sometimes lament of a large portion of the player base. Because of Tekken's history as a pretty movement-focused series, there's an expectation from players that movement ought to be able to be utilized to solve more parts of the puzzle than what it currently does. I mean, you could argue that Bamco already put a chain on unhindered sideways movement way back in Tekken 6 with the addition of homing moves, a category of attacks that track the opponent regardless of direction they step and distance they cover. It follows somewhat reasonably from this stance that buffing sideways movement actually gives homing moves a clear use case instead of them often being mishmashed in with other attacks that just happen to track the opponent super well without being homing. More system interaction, more options, more great fighting gaming. Let's take a look at a pretty standard set of interactions in Tag 2 vis-a-vis -vis its sideways movement. But before that, this video is sponsored by nobody, actually, or maybe me. I do technically lose money on each of these projects, so if you like these enough to try and help me mitigate that, oh boy, do I have the news for you. The Rubbish Patreon is open and you can join the prestigious ranks of people giving me money to stave off my inevitable bankruptcy. So, if you have an interest in that, please feel free to check it out. Links in the description. Our sidestepping character of choice will be Brian, something that might feel like an odd choice, considering that Brian is in no way noteworthy in said department. Having a pretty normal character size, not being especially nimble or moving especially far. This is, of course, the entire point of using him as an example. If Brian can do stuff, then the rest of the cast can more or less do the same. Up against Brian, we have series protagonist Kazia, who will, at different sets of frame advantages, try to attack Brian with a set of moves to showcase the risk mitigation possible with sideways movement. The moves in question are Electric Wind God Fist, Kazia's signature launcher and strong pressure move a really fast high attack with a large hitbox in both directions, susceptible to sidestep and sidewalk to his right, but because of the hitbox size, this is hardly done without any risk. Hell Sweep Kasia's signature mix-up low attack, a foot sweep with pretty long reach and decent enough tracking, very high risk if blocked and is usually sidewalk to Kasia's right. Down forward 2. Kazia's signature homing mid attack and counter hit tool. Down forward 2 is a large hitbox mid attack that is unsafe on guard, but as earlier stated, is homing and so will always catch sidewalks to either direction. At low amounts of frame advantage, we'll see that Brian is afforded a strong consistent way to risk mitigate Kasia's offense by step guarding, giving him a way to nullify all of these options if Kasia just mindlessly throws them out. He'll make Hell Sweep and Electric Wind God Fist whiff and will block in time to punish Kasia trying to catch step with the homing down for two. At mid amounts of frame advantage, we'll see a shift in this risk warp dichotomy. Because Brian has been hit with a stronger or riskier attack, he is given less leeway in terms of risk mitigation, meaning that he, in this case, has to choose between step guarding down for two and electric, or sidewalking electric and hell sweep. Both options are still good risk mitigation, but there is now a shank in the armor, so to speak. At large amounts of frame advantage, the system has again put a wrench in Brian's defensive options, and rewarded Cassia for making a strong read or punish. Brian now has low amounts of risk mitigated possibilities, and must instead opt for hard reads for strong defensive reward. Sidewalking Hell Sweep will get him launched by Electric, and hit by Downfall 2. 
but Stepguard will still get clipped by Hellsword. When I lay it out like this, it seems like a pretty great system, right? Movement can at low amounts of frame advantage be strongly applied, even against attacks with great tracking or large hitboxes, putting a stop to autopilot offense. But at the same time, movement suffers a setback and requires different levels of risk assessment once you're put at more sizable levels of disadvantage. Only, I haven't been fully honest with you. These scenarios I've just laid out for you, with all their nuanced interactivity, don't actually stem from Tekken Tag 2. It is instead how it all comes together in Tekken 7's movement system. Yes, you did hear that right. As compared to Tekken 7, Tag 2's sidestep not only moves further quicker, but it crucially also allows for a faster step to guard. A lethally efficient combination of properties that open the door wide open for risk mitigation. So what, you might be asking yourself. Kasia's homing move will still jack Brian up or force him to be fine with being open to Hellsweep. What does it matter if Kasia just has to be at a slightly higher frame advantage for this to work? I mean, what could go wrong with giving people more strong defensive options? The effects on gameplay that movement of this strength has cannot be stressed enough. Unlike Tekken 6 and 7, Tag 2 is a game that is fundamentally defense oriented, where offensive action, almost regardless of how advantageous of a situation the attacker finds themselves in, is inherently a high risk proposition. The addition of super strong defensive movement, coupled with the power of launchers through the game's combo system, acts to further repress the strategic value of poking. Not only is poking statistically undervalued purely numbers-wise in terms of reward, the risk-reward ratio of accosting the opponent with poking attacks is further skewed because of the strength of the movement options available to pretty much the entire cast. Have fun painstakingly reducing your opponent's HP to 30% through pokes, only to have them step guard your downforce 1 at plus 8 and take 80% of your life bar while also replacing their own. Because of what these risk reward ratios boil down to, the hallmarks of Tag 2 play at decent levels tend to be way more focused on extremely low commitment play. A recurring action you might catch and not be familiar with if you've only played Tekken 7 is the focus on moving with your opponent. Because step guard is such a strong defensive action, you will often see players who, knowing what their weak side is and where their opponent will probably be stepping to, try to step with their opponent to realign before attempting an attack. Something that does allow for continued offense but it is of course very susceptible to the opponent calling it out and trying to counter hit the then delayed attack. 
and while this on a technical level means step guard doesn't automatically solve any and all pressure situations, it still obviously casts its very long shadow over them. And considering the Tekken 7 community at large has continued to moan about how unfun the defensive application of Ling Xiaoyu stands, Art of Phoenix is an option that is dealt with in the exact same way, i.e. stepping with her, I'm somewhat positive most players would agree with me that the mind games that Step Guard offer don't sound that enticing. If you add together all of the ways the systems in Tag 2 interact, you end up with a game that, in the end, only really rewards one way of playing. A large reason why the Mishimas are considered so strong in Tag 2, even though their moveset isn't on paper much crazier than in any other modern title, is that Tag 2 massively undervalues set play through Oki, strong keep out with poking, close range bulldog pressure and the like. The strength of character mostly comes down to how strong they are at making whiffs happen and how hard they can punish said whiff. That's more or less the game in a nutshell. Tag 2 has a massive roster, yes, a massive roster with actually quite good inter-character balance just going by the numbers. The problem is that the vast majority of the characters all want to do the exact same thing, meaning there is less of an argument to play lower strength characters than in basically any other Tekken title. All characters are equal, but some characters are more equal. Oh, and the massive roster size not only makes practically zero ground to combat the issue of homogeneous play, it also doubles up the often felt negative aspect of having Tekken feel like homework. Wild offense might be overly risky and a statistically poor way to win in the long run, but you'll still have to memorize twice the amount of strings and setups per match compared to Tekken 7, lest you run into a boxing dinosaur with rage that will delete your entire life bar because you assumed that his punching string had ended. But hey, I don't know, maybe you fucking love defense-focused symmetric game systems. Though, I can't say I've seen a sizable overlap between people playing Tekken 7 and chess, a game I'd say has more in common with Tekken Tag 2 than a lot of other fighting games. Comparing Tag to chess might seem like a reach at best and some armchair critic shit at worst but there's a strong thematic similarity at play. Chess, because of the nature of the inherent symmetry of the game pieces, positioning and goals, almost innately favors a defensive and reactive way of playing. Sure, there certainly exist tricks and gambits in the world of chess, but at the baseline level of play, chess is primarily a game about making as few mistakes as possible. A game about losing less as opposed to winning more. A common critique from beginners or amateurs of the game is that the opening parts of a chess game can feel a bit aimless. You start out in a seemingly strong situation already, and these opening moves often feel like being forced to move and hoping you don't overstep your boundaries. The real meat of the game for these players start happening once a board state has developed in which one can clearly see what further moves can create. This mid-game board state has created an asymmetry in which clearer goals can be gleaned. Obviously, the stronger you are at chess, the earlier this will occur, as you extrapolate several moves ahead, but the same thing is happening. The strong, homogeneous and almost symmetrical game plans of the cast in Tag 2 reinforce a similar lose-less hegemony. If you both have the same goal and you achieve it in the same way, the game takes on a very distinct flair. Fighting games tend to be asymmetric for this very reason. Strong asymmetry creates easily identifiable goals within character matchups. 
conjuring up images of a character with strong zoning options versus a short reach grappler immediately informs you of what the general goals of the players piloting them will be. Hell, you could make the argument that a core quality of a fighting game is this asymmetry. Or at least what people expect. I mean, consider how most people feel about mirror matches. Lots of people from the Tekken community seem to believe that the sort of homogenous matchups present in Tag 2 are what has been the standard for the series in all of its modern incarnations pre Tekken 7. But that is absolutely not the case. While it is true that Tekken is historically a game with less asymmetrical matchups than, say, Street Fighter, it is still a core aspect of its character design. Looking back just one iteration to Tekken 6, the game that Tekken Tag 2 is heavily based upon, makes this fact easily observable. If we take a look at a matchup between a character like Alisa and a character like Julia, who both in a lot of aspects might seem like pretty bog standard Tekken characters, makes this readily apparent. Alisa in Tekken 6 has low impact mix up, basically zero counter hit tools, bad throws and not very noteworthy combo damage or wall pressure. But on the flip side of this has the combination of very safe long range pokes and the movement speed of a fucking rocket ship. While Yulia on the other hand combines strong bulldog style pressure tools with amazing combo damage and high risk high reward mix up tools making the goals of the characters quite apparent if you have a basic understanding of their toolkits. And this is a matchup between two, in the grand scheme of things, not especially unique characters. Characters like Ling Xiaoyu or Jack bring very strong flavor to character matchups. Xiaoyu, by way of her high-risk slippery movement and very oppressive Okizeme game, making being on the ground a really scary proposition and Jack with his combination of long range checking tools, the relative safety of his up close full crouch game and his limited movement options by virtue of his size. All of these differences, minute or gargantian, will skew what your immediate goal is at round start. Tag 2 takes all of these unique character qualities and throws them right in the fucking bin and in the process of doing so, makes the player less active. It would be facetious of me to say that Tag 2 uniquely favors risk mitigation as a winning strategy. Risk-averse play is a hallmark of high-level fighting games. Taking unnecessary risk is not conducive to winning. There, I said it. But when active play more or less becomes synonymous with high risk, I feel like it hampers the experience. There is a subset of players who find the risk minimizing, highly analytical play of chess and tag 2 extremely beautiful. And on some levels I understand that, there is a sense of purity to it, at least conceptually to 5000 IQ Mishima players jostling for the slightest misstep from their opponent taking a mile if given an inch. The reality, however, is that Tag 2, to me, often feels like two idiots walking back and forth, just hoping the other idiot will get bored before they do, so they can hit them over the head with a tactical nuke. I might be wrong. Maybe that is your idea of some good-ass Tekken. And that's fine. But I sure as hell ain't interested in finding out who's the best at not losing. I'm much more invested in knowing who is number one at winning. And I'm certainly not alone in thinking that. Tekken 7 with all its imperfections is still more interesting to me. Maybe you think that makes me reckless and impulsive. And maybe that's true. But you know what? I'll bear that cross, because who really wants to live forever?